today, I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about how I learned to change the future. I'm a futurist. The future is my business. I work for the Intel Corporation, the company that makes the, the microchips, the intelligence that goes into your devices, into your laptops, into the internet. And it's my job to look 10 to 15 years into the future and create a vision for how people will act and interact with technology, basically what it will feel like to be a human in 10 to 15 years. This is a, a very pragmatic job. I'm a principal engineer at the company because for Intel, it takes about five to 10 years to develop the chips. So it's of vital business importance today for my company to know what people will want to do a decade from now. The visions that I come up with, the futures that I build, are very pragmatic because ultimately, I need to build them. The company needs to build them. And that's the type of futurist that I am. This is why figuring out the future and thinking about the future is so important to me. You can pretty much tell everything you need to know about me by looking at this picture. The tall, skinny, bald one is me. The small, good-looking one is Arthur. I labeled them just so you would know. As I said, you can tell everything you need to know about me by looking at this picture. Because Arthur was the first robot ever created at the University of Essex Robotics Lab. I do a lot of work with robots, a lot of work with artificial intelligence. And as I said, you can figure out everything you need to know about me by looking at this picture. Evidenced by the fact that I went all the way to England and had my picture taken with a 20-year-old robot, you can rest assured I am a geek. <laughs> I am a huge nerd. Look at me. Look, look at my smile. I'm so happy to be standing next to this little robot. Now, I think I was born a nerd. I think I was born a geek. My first job was when I was 10 years old, and I worked in the computer lab at the local college. I was about this big. I taught the economic students how to use the computers. So here's a little 10-year-old, and you imagine walking in as a university student, here comes this little 10-year-old walking over and teaching you how to use the computers. I was born a geek. I always had a book in my hand, and that was always science fiction. I loved science fiction. It fueled my imagination. I was always the weird little kid in the science fiction stories who rooted for the robots. I wanted the robots to win, and then the humans would win. I'd be like, oh. <laughs> but robots! So, science fiction fueled me. It fueled my imagination. It made me want to understand how machines thought, and how I could talk with machines, and how I could build these, these amazing ideas. And so that's what led me to, to become a futurist. And to pursue technology, pursue the job that I have now, but I never forgot and never let go of the imagination side and of the storytelling side of what I do. Now, in my job as a futurist, I, I look out and see from where things are going. And this, this picture here depicts, I think, something that is incredibly important that I see that's coming. As I look out to the year 2020, the size of meaningful computational power, the size of the chips that go in all of your devices, the size of meaningful computational power is approaching zero. Now, I have to tell you, that was just a geek test. If I said, when I said, the size of meaningful computational power approaches zero, and you got goosebumps, you're a geek. <laughs> now, if you didn't get goosebumps, that's okay. You're going to have a very good life. You're going to have a very good social life. You might even see the sun. I don't see the sun very often. But the reason why this is so important is that as the size of meaningful computational power approaches zero, it means we can turn anything into a computer. We could turn these chairs into a computer. We could turn my jacket into a computer. We could even turn my body into a computer. And it fundamentally changes the questions that we have to ask ourselves. 
For decades, we had to ask ourselves, can we do something? Can we take a PC and make it small enough to fit on your lap? Can we make a laptop small enough to be a smartphone? Can we do it? But when you have the size of meaningful computational power approaching zero, the question we have to ask is not can we do it, but what? What do we want to do? If we can turn anything into a computer, what do we do? And this means that we are at a very interesting point in the history of humanity. We have reached a point where science and technology have progressed to the point where what we build is only constrained by the limits of our imaginations. I find this incredible. I find this incredible because it means the deficit for imagining the future, the deficit that we have is not our science, not our technology, not our machines, but ourselves and our own imagination. Our own ability to imagine a future, to imagine a different future, so we can bring that into being. So you think about this world, and, and as we think about how do we go about building, because again, I'm a very pr pragmatic futurist, what could we use? What, what possible tool could we use to imagine futures? We have the science and the technology. What could we use to fuel our imaginations? I go back to that little 10-year-old, that little 10-year-old nerd, and then I remembered science fiction. The little, the little geek in me was like, yay, science fiction. And the reason is that science fiction gives us a language to talk about the future. Science fiction, based on science fact, actually allows us to prototype the future. It actually allows us to imagine the human impact of what we are going to build. All good stories, all good movies, all good comic books are about humans and about people and our interaction with each other. So a science fiction story based on science fact allows us to explore the human impact, allows us to explore the cultural impact, the ethical impact of the things that we are developing today in these possible futures. Now, I'm quite proud of, of all these images up here because they come from a project that, that I'm doing called the Tomorrow Project, which is just about that, is about imagining these futures. And these are all examples of stories and visions that people have had about the future. Everybody from best-selling science fiction authors all the way down to regular folks, writing science fiction, talking about where they're going. And this is so important because Science fiction allows us to ask a very important question. What kind of future do you want to live in? Science fiction allows us to say, what is the future that we want and what is the future that we want to avoid? And then we can have these stories and share them with our friends, with our families, with our coworkers, with our government. We can say, this is the future that I want and this is the future I want to avoid. So as you can imagine, I'm now grown, I'm a futurist, I'm now using science fiction to develop the future. What could be more awesome? <laughs> imagine that little 10-year-old thinking this is the most awesomest awesome thing ever. I'm very happy. <laughs> and then I meet this guy. This is James H. Carrot. James is a historian. He's actually my age. But he lives his life in the past and studying the past. He is a, a cultural historian. And I was sitting down and, and talking to him about the work that I was doing, about using science fiction to imagine possible futures and to have conversations about the future. And wasn't this awesome? And it was great. And he smiled at me and he said, no, that's, that's very good, yes. You know you're missing 50% of the equation. You're missing half the story. So I was in. I was hooked. I said, well, what am I missing? He said, well, the other half of the story is quite simple. It's history. And he had me. I was hooked. So we started doing some research. We started researching. James is, as I said, a cultural historian. He studied the beatniks and the hippies. And he told me about this subculture called steampunk. And steampunk are, is a subculture that takes 21st century technology and reimagines it in the Victorian era. They're playing with technology and they're reimagining the past. 
And so I said to him, well, if they're reimagining the past, doesn't that mean they want a new future? Ooh. So we started thinking about this and working together. We did several years of research. We, it ultimately came out into a book that we did called Vintage Tomorrows, which is a, a historian and a futurist try to figure out what steampunk can teach us about the future. And we learned some very interesting things that steampunk was all about technology and people's relationship with technology. When you grow up with a smartphone in your pocket or you sleep with a smartphone next to your bed, the relationship you have with technology is very, very different. And so what we learned is that people want their technology to have a sense of humanity. They want their technology to be built by people. And they want their technology to know them personally as humans. We learned also that people want their technology to have a sense of humor. Humans are funny. We tell jokes. Why wouldn't our machines tell us jokes as well? Wouldn't that be great to, be, to laugh? But then the final thing that we learned, which I think was probably the most powerful, is that people wanted their technology to have a sense of history. And so what James pointed out to me is he said, just, Brian, as you think about science fiction and you use your imagination to, to take all this wonderful science and technology to imagine a future and to ask ourselves a very important question, what kind of future do you want to live in? We can also use that same process to ask ourselves, what kind of past do you want to be from? Because he says history is always in motion. History is incredibly important because to build a solid future, you need to build on a solid past. You need to have those conversations about the past so that you can use the past as an on-ramp to the future. So you have both the importance of both looking forward and looking backwards. So as a futurist, and as a futurist for a large corporation, I, I take my job very seriously. I realize that if I do my job correctly, I could affect the lives of almost every human being on the planet. I could not only affect their lives, but I could make their lives better. So I take this very seriously. And so what I did is I set off and wanted to answer this question, how do we change the future? I believe that the future is not an accident. The future is not some fixed point on the horizon that we're all hurtling towards, helpless to do anything about. The future is made every day by the actions of people. It's incredibly important to become active participants in the future. So how do we do that? So I went out and I spend most of my time outside of my company. I spend most of my time actually outside of the United States. And so I traveled around and I started asking anybody who would listen this question. How do we change the future? It's incredibly important. Right? The future is not an accident. And if the future is built every day by the actions of people, well, then how do we do it, right? The future is that important that you can't punt. You can't be passive. You can't sit back and let it happen. So what do we do? And I found myself in London, London, England, talking to Cory Doctorow. Cory is a science fiction writer and an activist. Um, and, and we were collaborating and we were talking about this and we were actually arguing because people got very upset when I asked this question. They would say, well, who are you to ask that question? Who are you to change the future? What makes you think you can do it? And I said, I understand that. I said, but somebody has to do it. It's in our hands collectively, so how do we do it? So Corey and I, as we were talking and we were fighting and we were arguing, we came up with, with this idea that is so simple, but I think so powerful. The way that you change the future is you change the story that people tell themselves about the future that they will live in. It's that simple. Change the story that people tell themselves about the future that they will live in. If you can do that, if you can change that story, if you can change the narrative, people will make different decisions. They will envision different futures. 
They will act differently. They will make different decisions with their personal lives. They will make different decisions for their families, for their communities, for their businesses, and possibly even the world. So how do we change that story? I'm a futurist, science fiction author, an author of nonfiction. So how do we change those stories? And then we realize that the way you change the story is through conversation. Right? We say to ourselves, this is the future that I want to be from, this is the future I want to avoid, this is the past that I would like to be from. And then you go and you talk to people. You have a conversation. You say, these are the things that I believe in, these are the things that are worrying me, these are the things that I believe in, what do you think? And you have a conversation and another conversation. Always remembering that the future involves everybody, every one of us. The future even involves people you don't agree with. Quite frankly, the future involves people you probably don't like, but it involves everybody. And that conversation is so incredibly important because if you have those conversations, you can actually change that story and change the future. So I want to ask you a question. Now you know. Now you know how to change the future. You have sat here in this audience all day at TED and listened to these ideas. That's what TED's all about. Ideas worth spreading. That's what TED is about. Passionate people telling personal stories. Now you've heard those. You have fuel for these conversations that you can have. You're a part of this. You were here. You listened. It's now your responsibility. So I want to ask you, now that you know how to change the future, what are you going to do? How are you going to change the future? Because you can. Each and every one of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.